Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Busara um, Leadership Partners. Uh, Dudu, you are always amazing to put these sort of things together. You and Tembisa, thank you and your team for inviting me all the way from Zimbabwe. Uh, most of you will know that we are um, off that beaten track of waiting for elections. Uh, they are done and dusted. Uh, we, we have a new old leader. Uh, 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 who is now our president. We're waiting for the cabinet. Uh, it doesn't look like we will have another election in the next five years. Uh, well, in 2018 is our next election. So part of my presentation to you is really to give you some uh, uh, snippets. I could never give you enough in a 45 minutes uh, speech uh, of what, uh, what some of the lessons we have learned. Uh, but I think Dudu wanted me to just give a backdrop of an environment, whether you're talking about networking or economic growth, an environment that you can always uh, reflect on. Uh, and one of those things that I felt needed to be expressed was just to start off, maybe because it's a woman's month, let me start off with a joke. Um, and there were three guys talking in a pub. Uh, two of them are talking about the control they have over their wives, while the third was actually listening and was quiet. After a while, one of the first two turns to the third man and says, well, what about you? What sort of control do you have over your wife? The third fellow says, I tell you, just the other night, my wife came to me on her hands and knees. The first two guys were amazed and says, wow, what happened then? They asked. And then the third man took a healthy swallow of his beer sighed and uttered, she said, get out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, women are always in control. Um, but let me just give you some, uh, what I call a deja vu. I don't have the slide here, I'll keep going down the slides, but I just, uh, because I like to do, I'm, I'm vertically challenged and I hate this thing, so I, I'd rather sit on, stand on the side like this. Because often people have to tell me, please stand up so we can see you. So I don't have to have that, pro I don't have to have that problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, it, the deja vu, here it is. And, and I'm talking about Zimbabwe here, but here's the deja vu for for a South African audience that is here. I'm not aware of any Zimbabweans that could be here, but if they're here, they could connect with me. Uh, and I'm just gonna wind back when Zimbabwe turned 18, and that was in 1998. So it's a deja vu moment, uh, and I'm seeing a few things. And also, I'm also swinging the clock a bit when South Africa turned 18. And here's the backdrop. Um, Zimbabwe, when it had turned 18, it had involved itself in the war in the DRC, which was a civil war. They were invited to take part there as part of the Sadat force, but Zimbabwe went, uh, were the only ones meaningfully involved with their forces there, and we lost both uh, material and, and, uh, and, and people, uh, um, our men and women of, uh, uh, in, in, in uniform, we lost quite a lot of them in that bloody war. Um, and when you, when you flip the coin, is just recently, maybe last year, maybe in the past few year, months, I see that South Africa has also had its own war in the Central African Republic, which we couldn't explain our DRC involvement. Uh, I have noticed that the South African government has not been very clear, at least to me, maybe it has been clear to you, why they were in the Central African Republic. Now they are in the DRC, but that again is a, is a deja vu moment, and I'm finding myself and saying, what happens at the age of 18? And you can do this when Zambia turned 18. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deja vu. Uh, when we turned 18, there was labor unrest, which resulted in food riots and service delivery protests uh, and demonstrations. Many lives were lost. 
and uh, there was a clampdown on uh, on uh, demonstrations at that time. Yeah, and then I flick the coin again, and I see there is uh, sewage spilling, there is marikana, uh, there is all sorts of things that are happening, and I'm saying, this is just too close for me to reconnect uh, after so long. Our currency, which was very strong for a long time, and uh, the Zimbabwean dollar was uh, hovering around between 5 to 7 to the US dollar, up to when we turned 18, uh, it crashed to about 10, 11, uh, in that Black Friday in 1997, just before then, and it started drifting to 1 to 15 and 1 to 20. The rest of the history you all are aware of. I find that when South Africa turned, turned 18, 19, your currency is something to be concerned about, but we also understand why it's doing that. We also had an issue with war veterans in, South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and uh, who demanded compensation uh, for, for their contribution to the Liberation War. Just recently, I just woke up from a nightmare to realize that similarly there's something that is happening in South Africa for the same thing. Well, our labor movement decided that enough was enough, so they turned themselves into a political party. Well, I'm not sure what is happening at Kosatu right now. Our economic growth was around 5 to 6 before then percent. It then plummeted to about 2 to 3 percent. I think the South African economic growth recent figures are around about the same. These are deja vu, so I just thought I'll throw these things to you. It's a background, whether you're talking about networking, it is always going to fall at the background of where the economy, the environment you're operating from is at. Now, let me just rush to say that what was then our legacy in Zimbabwe, and this is from just a survivor like myself. The aftertaste of colonialism and apartheid in Zimbabwe in our social uh, economic structures uh, existed and still exists up until now. You would think that after 33 years of independence, the colonialism, the apartheid structures in our social and economic structures should be over and done with it. It's still there. This continues to marginalize the majority. Now, it does not matter uh, whether you have um, a majority government or a black government, to put it uh, that way. Those structures, as long as they exist, they will continue to marginalize the, the majority. And we find that in Zimbabwe as well. This always causes the majority to have an uprising towards those who are in leadership and causes distortions on the economic front. The second aspect of the legacy that we still carry in Zimbabwe is the harsh reality of tribalism. This has resulted in the lack of development in certain communities. Whether you're talking about in Matevele land, whether you're talking about the Eastern Highlands. Um, so that tribalism has, has continued to wreak havoc um, in Zimbabwe. Uh, the third aspect, which I call the, leg the legacy pillars, which we must still continue to address, is the entitlement or the sense of entitlement by political liberators and economic liberators. Yes. There is always the sense of entitlement. I am entitled to this. This has become the bedrock of cronyism, corruption, and indeed polarity in our nation because I'm entitled. It doesn't matter. I don't need to have gone to the, to the bush to fight the war of liberation as myself. Um, though I grew up in the rural areas, I can claim a few errands I was sent by the then liberators, and uh, that would be my claim to fame. But also as an economic liberator, I would have a sense of entitlement, which leads to cronyism, corruption, and polarity in the society.
So those are the three things I think will continue to battle around. And I'm not sure in South Africa whether these things will continue to be of a challenge to you. But certainly, they continue to be our backdrop in Zimbabwe, whether it is now or into the future, uh, particularly now that we, uh, the, the ruling party, Zanu PF, is now back in power um, and uh, would address this. I'm not aware how they will do it because they have not pronounced the way forward as yet. Now, how have I uh, survived in this? And let me just say that, as a, as a biblical scholar myself as well, there's a, there's, a script, there's a scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. And it says, um, let me just go back to this now. And it says that, I return and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, um, nor the battle to the strong, uh, no bread to the wise, no riches to men of understanding, no favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance. Um, some of my most um, best in IQ uh, friends and contemporaries didn't have some of the opportunities that I had and they might not be where I am today. I have got a cousin who I grew up with in the rural areas, ate from the same place, slept in the same bed, um, and went into the same class. But um, our paths have taken different turns because time and chance was not the same as, uh, as for him and I. Each one of us has a has a unique chance and opportunities that only happen to them and not everyone else. Uh, your ability to, convince, to convert your chances through faith distinguishes you from another businessman or from another person. Our judgment is never in relationship with others, but in how we utilize what was in our hands. And that is true for us in, um, in Zimbabwe. It was always what we had in our hands. If the same thing uh, was thrown to someone else, maybe here in South Africa, I think the reaction would have been totally different. I talk to my friends here in South Africa, and they tell me, you guys, if this stuff was to happen to us in South Africa, we, there will be chaos. They will, we, will, we will go to war. Um, but you know, time and chance didn't happen to you. It has not happened to you. It has happened to us. How have we utilized that? Many of us have always been waiting for the elections, and Zimbabwe from 2000, I was counting the other day, has not had anything less than eight elections since 2000. So we've been a nation in elections. <laughs> and, and so a very disruptive process, um, um, and uh, with the same result. So um, it is, the result has not changed in eight years. And one of the things that I find myself with this, time and chance, just a little bit about my own experience. When I took over Zimbabwe Sun, which is African Sun now, uh, it was leveraged buyout uh, at an interest rate of 37.5% in 2002. But by 2005, the interest rate has had gone way over 1,000% per annum. That my last payment, uh, which was a three-year funding for, um, uh, for this leverage buyout of 32% of this listed entity. My last payment, I remember going to a nearby ATM machine <laughs> to go and draw out the last payment to pay out, because that's how hyperinflation had beneficiated some of us. So it's time and chance. I could never, it was worth, it was a $2.5 million transaction at that time. But to think that my last payment, I only had to go and draw down from an ATM machine. That's how the wealth transfer happened, and that's how the damage to the economy also happened. So I am a beneficiary of that chaos. 
and not everybody in this room would have had that opportunity. So it was not because I was clever. I was there at the right time, in the right place. Now, in Zimbabwe, and there are very few things that I've learned, it's easier to obtain than to maintain. That's one of the things we have learned. When we got our independence in 1980, we, fought, we thought that we had finally arrived, but yet the journey had only just begun. Um, and let me just say that the liberators had a sense of achievement and accomplishment, yet the years that followed, the people became increasingly needy and poor. It is always easier to obtain than to maintain. When we got our land from um, uh, our land from 2000, we had the sense of arrival. Yet, for the first time, we were to import grain over the next decade from Zambia, an unlikely source. We mocked and, and jeered at the Zambians, and we jeered at their currency at that time. I remember in the 1980s and the 1990s. Zambia was a basket case. But I know that in the past few years, we also became one. To the point that we begin to import grain. This year, we are importing all our maize, or the bulk of it, from Zambia, who we used to export maize to. So it's easier to obtain than to maintain. We do have all the land that we want. Let me just say that that problem, you, I mean, South Africa is still sorting out whether it's land reform programs that they want to get into. The government owns it, but it is there. Uh, it is less productive as it used to be. Over of Zimbabwe Sun, there was a sense of achievement, yet years that followed the company continued to suffer due to both exogenous and endogenous reasons. We were a bad smell wherever we went. Um, looking for capital. Oh, well, I'm from Zimbabwe, I like to do this. No capital markets wanted us. So we, we suffered that problem. Um, and it became difficult. Uh, I talked to hoteliers here in South Africa. We used to run the Grace and Rose Bank. We came out after the World Cup because of the influx of rooms in this enclave in Santa. Um, but our break even uh, for our hotels ranges between 25 percent to 35 percent occupants. It's a dream for a South African hotel to break even at that level. And that's part of our, our problem. But our product became de deteriorated, deteriorated and uh, we struggled to, uh, to match some of the international standards. So the intent is to grow, otherwise you'll be dying. Unfortunately, much of Africa begins to meaningfully grow after decades of economic plunder and decadence. We don't grow from where we are. We have to destroy first, and then we grow. And that's the history we have. What well, without we chance of swimming with the sharks? Business for me has been like swimming with the sharks. Never be naive that because the shark has not attacked you, it is assumed you are also a shark. <laughs> We had lots of that. It was, it was a survival of the fittest in Zimbabwe. Uh, it, it was not just who you know, it is where you came from, uh, um, uh, vulnerable to any sharks. So swimming with the sharks, uh, you had to be very um, um, alert and not naive. In other words, keep close to your friends and partners and also keep your adversaries closer. Never ignore your adversaries. We're talking about networking here. We had to know the whole chain of networking, from who the political uh, guru is right at the back of this transaction that you're doing, who, who has the final control, um, and know them and what it is and what it takes to survive. Otherwise, if you didn't do that, you could not survive. That's the reality. You could, now I can say it's a different world altogether after the past few years of the um, GNU government that has just ended. But let me say that it, it, you had to know the whole food chain. Uh, not even their own relatives, you had to know them. <laughs> Always give attention to the dissenting voice. That could be your alarm bell. Sometimes we learned very quickly, uh, realizing that you, you, you mustn't um, just ignore the person that says, mm, I'm not quite sure whether you're doing the right thing. 
Uh, after a few years, I learned that you had to listen a little bit more to them because um, that was a message that would be told to you in a nicer way. Because the next time it said, you will not be where you are, you would have lost what you have. And we found that. Um, I, I was talking to some of uh, my white colleague farmers uh, who now when they say, look, we, we, we wish we had listened a little bit and not hurried to have behaved the way we did around the opposition party or the labor movement at that time. Because the whole thing has turned full circle and nobody knows what to do next. So if they had just listened to the dissenting voice at that time, they might have saved themselves the pain and the agony they went through. And indeed, there was a lot of untold pain there. Anyone who talks the, uh, uh, negative behind your back is an adversary. Bring them close. I've learned that you bring them close. You don't fight them. You don't push them away. You just bring them closer. Make them some level of pattern and make them lose something in the process. When you've been attacked while swimming with the sharks, <laughs> make very little movement to avoid too much blood spilling. <laughs> A lot of you here in South Africa used to ask, how are you Zimbabweans uh, coping with this situation? We learned the skill of not kicking too much. <laughs> you lose too much blood if you didn't. And when we came here, how's things? All oh, fine. <laughs> oh, we, we're doing very well. It's only people who had then decided they would stay in South Africa, they would say exactly what they wanted to say. We were coached and couched <laughs> to say the right things so that you don't kick and fret too much lest you lose blood. When you go back there, you could be losing a lot more blood than you thought. So. <laughs> So you were told that we have a few challenges back home. <laughs> we're not told that we, we were not trained to say we have lots of problems. <laughs> but we have a few challenges and we can, we can overcome them. Uh, and how is the political situation? Well, uh, we believe that uh, uh, things will come right one day. <laughs> we, 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 were, we were trained. To, to not kick too much, lest you lost a bit of blood, and if not, a lot of blood. All relationships must be maintained on principle rather than need. The need will eventually fall away when the results, uh, yeah, when, uh, when, when then the result in a shark attack. So uh, it's important that we, we learn that you, you stick to, to the principle. Uh, some of us who were there were sticking to the principle, a name that's called a Dororo. This, this little animal can survive in mud, but when you hold it, there is nothing muddy around it. And we learned to behave like that. Uh, that you, you, you must still be in this messy environment, but there mustn't be anything that is around you that says, hey, and how did you do that? And where did you get that? And tell us the full story about this. How did you buy that car? How did you get that business? Some of us had to declare and write and make it public how we got to where we are. Because we didn't want to be misunderstood for having taken advantage of uh, situations uh, or become corrupt in the process. When we formed uh, a company called Dawn Properties, we unbundled it. There was a lot of problems when we uh, did that. And, um, um, and, and uh, a lot of diverse interests. When we started, it was all, everybody was excited, but people had diverse interests, and then they began to be sharks within the house. Um, uh, the relationships were based on, um, on a need rather than on a principle. We paid the full price. Let me just say, I paid the full price of it in the past three years when there was a corporate war between uh, the company that I am, and, and, and then we also had a controlling stake in Don but there were some sharks that had invaded that company. And uh, we paid it dear. And some of you would Google that. There were some wars that um, I still have scars to show for it. How about debt? This is part of our problem in Zimbabwe. You know that we do not have uh, mortgage lenders. We don't have HP financing. We don't have meaningful uh, debt financing in Zimbabwe. If you have debt, it is at no less than 18% per annum on a US dollar loan. 
uh, not even on a rand loan, but on a US dollar loan. Um, so over the years, because we have been trained to do that way, a lot of Zimbabweans have owned their property. Their house they live in is theirs. The bicycle they are riding is theirs, and it's debt free. The cars they're driving in the street is theirs, and it's debt free. Um, <laughs> and um, you, but the companies they now are running are debt ridden. The problem that arose was the shift between the dollarized or the hyperinflation and the dollarized era. We moved from where you know it didn't matter how many Zim dollars you get in your in your in your account uh, to where it now mattered well, how many US dollars you have. But it, it also moved with assets that were non-revenue generating. Now you have to run businesses that are revenue generating and you have to borrow at those high interest rates and the liquidity was not enough. The financial crisis in the USA was a warning for us, but this was drowned by the positive noises of the World Cup coming to South Africa. Let me just say this, the humor about this, being in the tourism myself, that uh, there was actually cabinet committees formed in Zimbabwe to manage the World Cup benefits in Zimbabwe. Um, we even had um, a committee on gate takings, um, a committee on uh, media, a committee on stadia, infrastructure. I remember challenging all this and uh, highlighting that this um, World Cup was going to be in South Africa. Um, but that was falling on the FDA. So we ended up in the one that was uh, um, responsible for fan packs. Remember the fan packs we had? Mm -hmm. Oh, we, uh, we had it all in Zimbabwe. We had our own LOC, local organizing committee. Um, and FIFA had to rebuke us that there's only one LOC. <laughs> one that was in South Africa. But we didn't listen to these noises at all. Um, let go what you can before you sink. So we had to start restructuring our business, African Sun. Uh, we had picked up a lot of uh, overhead structure over the years, and then we had to restructure. We had to make sure that we almost cut our cost structure into half. Um, and we did that restructuring. It cost us about three million US dollars, but we, were man we managed to have a payback in less than 12 months of that. We had to do it. We lost able and capable people. <laughs> Beware of becoming a whitewashed baboon. A lot of our Zimbabwean uh, business people, and indeed at a personal level, we are passionate about assets, what we own and what we have. But I, I tell this story from my rural background, where we used to chase away baboons from the fields. We used a scarecrow, and the scarecrow, the baboons will soon get used to it because it doesn't move. After a while, they challenge it, and they realize it's just a scarecrow. <laughs> But we also used to have these half drums and uh, that hole, uh, the, the lead of or the, the, the hole into the drum, we then put uh, roasted mealies into the drum so that we could catch these baboons. So it will put its hand in there and try to haul out the mealy and realize that it can't. So it will, and then we'll put a bell around this drum. So when it is shaking it, the bell will ring and there's little boys we would run to the, to the field, realizing we've caught a baboon. We would literally, let me just be crude about this, we would literally kill this baboon as little boys. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I'm in tourism, I'm not supposed to. We would kill it. But it wasn't, it was a gruesome thing. So even us, we didn't like it. So we, we, we designed another method. And this method was we used to use the whitewash that is used to put in our mud houses in the rural area, the whitewash. Some of you would know. So we'll bring the whitewash and paint this baboon white whilst it's still trying to get its hand out. Eventually we would, because it's exhausted, eventually we would let its hand go and then it would rush into the mountains. Ah. Two things happened when the baboon met its own friends or its own family. 
First of all, the family has never seen a white baboon. <laughs> so they would run from this baboon. Um, and as you know, baboons are very social animals. They, 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 are, they are family animals. So they, they suffer neglect and they suffer depression. So every time it's coming, it says, it's me, I'm sure, I don't know their language, it says, it's me. <laughs> baboon, the other baboon says, no, we, 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 we don't know you. <laughs> and now, as they are running away from this baboon, they would actually run away further away from the fields. So for three months, you wouldn't see baboons around. But after a while, as we would be heading cattle, we would then find the white baboon dead because of loneliness. Now, this is the sad story, and I'm glad I've caught your attention on that. <laughs> but the issue is that many of us in Zimbabwe have become whitewashed baboons, laddened with debt, and no one wants to associate with us. At an economic level, we are borrowed to the rest of the world by 10 billion US dollars. And we are in this, and at a personal level, Many of our people are borrowed to the extent that their treasured assets are no longer to the level that they are borrowed. They are much less. So they've now become whitewashed for goods. And people are committing suicide back home. Companies are going on. Families are becoming decimated because the breadwinners are, are losing everything. Kids are being thrown out of school because of that. We also have our own share of that as a company. We are currently restructuring our debt and we are selling some of the assets we treasured in the past few years so that we can survive. Do not escape from your responsibility. The whole idea is about getting on shore, engaging creditors, shareholders, our banks who would have shut the whole company down. This is what we did. And uh, we had to get Africa's in bank to bail us out. Uh, we would have also been a whitewashed baboon. That's a sad reality. What about overheads? Overheads, actually, we have learned in Zimbabwe that they walk on two legs, period. <laughs> None of these other um, stories that we are told. From payroll better to total cost, wherever those two legs go, they incur costs. Remember, I'm here, I'm an overhead. And you're here, you are an overhead. Limit where these two legs go, or two-legged creatures go. And who goes, because sometimes if the wrong person goes, it's more cost. And how many go? Well, we've learned that you cut back on that. Fortunately, we don't have such a unionized labor um, um, background. Um, we would have been toast many years ago. Overhead grows by osmosis. Quantify overheads beyond salary burden. This is what we learned. Office space, utility bills, travel and stationery, conferencing costs. <laughs> Ah, the main culprits. <laughs> but we have had to cut down. There is never one cockroach in the kitchen, so, so say Warren Buffett. When you encounter a small cost problem, there is always another lurking somewhere. We have realized that if you hear that, well, we, we have this slight problem in our operations or in our, in our housekeeping you know there is something in our front of house. There is never, because cockroaches do not survive as individual animals. They also have some other cousin cockroach somewhere, brother and sister somewhere. So we've learned to always say, if I've got one problem, there is more. And so you sober up. Rather than say, once I fix this problem, I'm cruising, my life is in order. No, it's not. We've learned that it's not. Uh, there's something lacking out there. Now that even right now, we think, well, the elections are over, we should be moving on, we still have a slight problem of adjusting to this. 
That's little like one cockroach. We know there is something lurking in the corner. We're always alert in our combative mood. The circle of competence is one of the things we learned. If you do not understand the business, do not get into it. We had to get into a business called Hotelson, which was a, a, a logistics and, and, um, and supply business to bring imports into Zimbabwe, um, particularly from South Africa. It is a business we didn't have a competence for. We have suffered dear of having got into that business. We realize we must stick to the needy. Don't get into things because they are available. If you cannot find businesses within your circle of competence, do not expand the circle. Wait. Often, that's what we began to do. We began, banks were buying bricks to hedge against inflation. That's not a joke. They would buy bricks, millions of bricks. They would be on their balance sheet. Hundreds of cars would be on their balance sheet. When the whole tide turned, no one could buy the bricks, nor the cars. Don't get into a business you don't have the competence for. Recognizing talent is totally different from having talent. The tragedy of brain drain and literacy rate. We also begin to understand that Zimbabwe, last year and this year, still has the honors of, become, of being the most literate country in the whole of Africa. But we have learned that literacy is not equal to skill. Literacy is a raw material for skill. And uh, we can have that. Yes, you can speak you know, to an old granny who is 70 years old in English in the rural areas. But it does not, we have had a lot of skills drained from Zimbabwe to our neighbors, including you here in South Africa. <laughs> um, you have benefited from a lot of our skills here. Um, and, and we are suffering because of that. So the literacy rate is not equal to skill. So um, we have learned to now retrain. We have a training organization that trains every day of the month and, 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 and the whole year round. Why? We are realizing that because of the economic situation in Zimbabwe, people will always look outside. But we must train those who come in. And it has paid dividends for us to continue training. So, our bigger budget in our HR cost is always the training one to keep our skills abreast to where we should be. It is not the economy that we eventually do it, but the attitude of investors and management. I've never had to leave Zimbabwe. Uh, I don't think I will leave. I'll probably die there. Um, but it's because the, the opportunities in Zimbabwe are immense. Particularly as I look forward to the next five years, I think there'll be great opportunities for us uh, as we look to um, Re reigniting the economic factors and the indicators in Zimbabwe uh, is the government begins to realize that it is about dealing with service, dealing with what the people want, and I think that is going to be handled going forward. So it's the people that are there. It's not the economy. It's not where the economy is. It's where the people are at. A pin lies for every bubble. We've, I've realized that in the hyperinflation, everything was booming. I mean, uh, profits were hyper, um, we had super profits. But every territory has its pain too. Have a thick skin and a sober mind. The media will raise you and yet will destroy you, but there is nothing called bad publicity. It's all publicity. Just recently, I just landed from Victoria Falls where we are having the UNWTO uh, conference summit, the 20th session, uh, which we are jointly hosting between Zimbabwe and Zambia. Uh, the same media that hailed, uh, that pulled us down over the years because of some of the things that we were doing, uh, we caused those things. Um, and it's the same media that has now begun to raise. There is nowhere I've been in this whole world, and I've tried quite, uh, traveled quite immensely, where people do not know Zimbabwe and do not know our president, Robert Mugabe. <laughs> um, and that he is still the president for the next five years. And, and that in itself, uh, we are not unknown, so we are leveraging on that. And the fact that we <laughs> successfully hosted this UNWTO in the backdrop of what people had thought we were is an amazing feat. So we, we, media is, is there to be bad and good media, but let me say that there is no publicity that is bad. It's all we have learned in Zimbabwe. It's all good. Eventually, people will know you. 
Um, uh, you want to be known for good things, but they will still know. Your success is measured by successful succession. That is what we are realizing. We have a succession problem in Zimbabwe at all levels. The country at the political level, at the private sector level, even in communities, we are failing to succeed each other successfully. Um, and that is going to be our challenge going forward. What about reinforcing failure? Do not fall in love with a project, we learned that, but fall in love with value. Acquisition of assets as a hedge against hyperinflation. Now we have assets that do not have economic value on our balance sheet. As I said earlier on, we are now beginning to take these off. You must believe in it wholeheartedly, but, uh, but, you, uh, but you must be prepared to let it go when it shows signs of sustained failure. The whole journey on the grace and the lakes. We, we used to run the grace in, uh, in Rosebank and the lakes in Benoni. And uh, one of the things that we realized post the, um, the World Cup was to say, well, this was a useful property for us. It made money for us, but it's about time to get up. So in 2011, we got out. We just said enough is enough. We cannot sustain the losses. Our costs, um, utility costs had gone up, rates had gone up. The city of Jobek had raised this cost. We said, look, this hotel is better owned and run by the owner rather than be leased the way we, we had. That structure was unsustainable. Turn your back on heroics. Cut the fishing line when you catch a crocodile. You will be able to fish another day. <laughs> um, that we learned, that um, we, we became uh, heroes of getting the biggest thing. But sooner rather than later, when you realize that you've caught a crocodile, let it go because you might hold in a crocodile that will eat you. <coughs> Cut the fishing line and then move on to fish elsewhere. Uh, this is, it's about legacy and not legends. Africa is obsessed by legends and not obsessed by legacy. The things that live beyond ourselves. We want a name. We are obsessed by celebrities. We've got celebrity politicians, celebrity business people, uh, celebrity um, pastors um, in Zimbabwe we have those celebrity um, just we are caught up in these heroics um, and we caught up in these legends we need legacy of businesses economies and uh, communities that are well run uh, after we are gone uh, and that's what we've realized but we're still caught up with legends that's why we have uh, heroes we talk more of heroes in Zimbabwe than legacies. <coughs> talent management as I finish. If you want to create wealth, there is one talent you require. We have learned that. The talent is to identify, hire, nurture others with talent. That's the talent you need. And we've always thought that it's about knowing about having talent. But the biggest talent that I think I've learned over the years is to be able to identify that this is good talent from its raw state, to hire it and to nurture it um, for the business that I have. Uh, talent is key to sustained growth and growth is key to early wealth. You cannot afford to skimp on it. And I, I believe that this is a lesson that South Africans have to push in, tap into those talents. And it's not always your affluent markets that will always have that talent. That talent is raw out there in the rural areas. Um, it's, 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 it's waiting to be tapped. Uh, one of my uh, things I do is just to go out in some of the rural communities and just tell them, that, tell them about hospitality, the opportunities that uh, it provides to rural folk. Um, our GDP programs are addressed, these are graduate development programs, address the brain drain. Uh, money is not always the great motivator. Talent knows its value, of course. But surprisingly, more often, it is more attracted to new opportunities and challenges. The poaching of our staff by competition over the years. We have been the bedrock of skill for um, the, the hospitality sector in Zimbabwe. And um, we have always realized that money is not the motivator here. Youth is a factor, but remember, you cannot teach a young dog old tricks. Blend youth with age. 
Um, it, this is what I've been learning, that it's important to bring in the balance there. Um, some people have swung to the other side. We don't want the old people, they slow us down, and then they end up in trouble. Or others say, we don't want the young people, they cause promotion and chaos for us. <coughs> the six rules are concerning talent. Fine. One, identify it, hire it, nature it, reward it, protect it from being poached. And finally, when time comes, fire it. God bless you. Thank you.